Peter B. Collins News and Comment. Yeah, it's Friday the 13th. April 13th, 2018. And it's not the official publication date of St. James Comey's tell-all book about his interactions with Trump. But the book has dropped unofficially. And the mainstream media is going bonkers. Everything else is put aside for the breathless coverage. Rachel Maddow was reading from a copy of the book last night, and then she handed it off to uh, Lawrence O'Donnell, and he had a copy of the book. And It's fascinating for me, because if you're a regular listener, you know that I am a longtime critic of the FBI. The Federal Bureau of Investigation has been a rogue agency since my early work in Chicago in the 1970s. Cointelpro, J. Edgar Hoover's controversial domestic intelligence program that led to the deaths of many African-American leaders, including Fred Hampton, a case that I covered in great detail. And so when I see people trying to define their alliances in the current topsy-turvy Trump world. It's painful and amusing all at the same time. For example, (laughs) there are many people who don't trust Comey because Trump is now his arch enemy. And they believe whatever Trump tweets, and uh, we're going to get to one of Trump's comments here in a moment. But on the other hand, we have people who used to be skeptical of the FBI when Bob Mueller was the Republican-appointed director under George W. Bush. And the Patriot Act gave the FBI expanded powers. It was James Comey who was working at the Justice Department and Bob Mueller heading the FBI. And Mueller was the one who gagged Sibel Edmonds and ignored her courageous whistleblowing about the double agents who were working at the FBI. I mean, these are just a few examples. And Comey presided over cases, oh, like Ed Snowden. Chelsea Manning was in the military justice system, so the FBI didn't have a direct role there. And then we get to the 2016 issues. And which side do you take? Was James Comey a hero for exonerating Hillary Clinton for the email scandal in July and then a scoundrel for reopening the case after Anthony Weiner's laptop showed emails that came from Hillary's State Department account? And then, of course, the letter right before the election where he said, never mind, we didn't find anything there. And so I find it fascinating. That for many people who buy the Trump-Russia line and the hyped coverage of MSDNC that only focuses on what's wrong with Trump every day, and there's plenty to cover, no doubt about that. But I think it's fascinating to watch reaction to Comey's book. So I've got a summary here of some of the key news items, and fundamentally, Comey does not advance the key issues related to Trump and Russia and alleged collusion. It's really a series of anecdotes. He talks about his early career fighting mafia dons in New York. And he makes many comparisons between mobsters and Trumpsters. And I think they are fairly accurate. Now, when Comey briefed Trump and his associates in early January of 2017, about uh, Russia's attempt to influence the election in favor of Trump, Trump and his advisors asked no questions about the apparent attack by a foreign power and concentrated only on the political implications and media strategies while Comey and the spooks were still in the room. And in Comey's book, he writes, Holy crap, they are trying to make each of us an amica nostra, a friend of ours. That's a mobster term. To draw us in, as crazy as it sounds, I suddenly had the feeling that the president-elect was trying to make us all part of the same family. And then at the end of that meeting, the FBI director and the guy with the bad comb-over went one-on-one 
And that's when he told him about the Steele dossier. And I think it's a fair interpretation for Trump and his people to believe that this was a Hoover-style brushback. Wouldn't it be a shame, Mr. President-elect, if this became public? At any rate, when he explained the Russia scene, the uh, you know golden shower scene in the presidential suite of the Moscow Ritz Hotel, Comey says Trump began to talk obsessively about women who'd accused him of sexual assault. And trying to cut him off, Comey told Trump he was not under investigation personally. Now, that seems to relate to the sexual allegations and not any kind of collusion with Russia. But, of course, we weren't there, so I can't uh, define the context. Later, in a phone call to uh, between Trump and Comey, Trump, according to Comey, obsessed about the allegation that he had consorted with prostitutes in Moscow. Trump said, I'm a germaphobe. There's no way I would let people pee on each other around me. (laughs) Comey says, I let out an audible laugh. I imagine the presidential suite of the Ritz-Carlton in Moscow was large enough for a germaphobe to be at a safe distance from the activity. He doesn't acknowledge whether there is a video of that or not. Then there was the dinner where the two dined alone in the White House and Trump asked Comey for loyalty. And again, the mob references come in. To my mind, the demand was like Sammy the Bull's Cosa Nostra induction ceremony with Trump in the role of the family boss asking me if I have what it takes to be a made man. After he got fired, John Kelly, who was Secretary of Homeland Security at that point, uh, commiserated with Comey and said he thought he ought to resign too And Comey says he urged him not to do that. Then he defends himself from the accusation that Trump has made that he's a leaker, saying that he did send a copy of an unclassified memo to the New York Times through an intermediary. To be clear, this was not a leak, no matter how many times the president calls it that. Then on the issues related to the late-in-the-campaign disclosure of the Wiener laptop with emails on it from Hillary Clinton... Well, we've got some detail on that in an article from The Guardian where one of the things that Comey says that I find so far-fetched is that uh, two weeks before the election, he felt that Hillary Clinton was a slam dunk. She was going to win. And then he made his back-and-forth revelations. We're renewing the investigation. We've closed the investigation. And I think it's fair to say that that did discourage a lot of people at the last minute, and probably push some into Trump's column. Now, of course, I want to be clear. I still believe that the election was manipulated in favor of Trump, not by Russians, but by Americans, who suppressed the vote, manipulated the vote in Detroit, and used many other schemes to deny Clinton a victory. Now, in a vague way, Comey says, hindsight's helpful. If I had it to do over again, I would do some things differently. But at least so far, this article doesn't enumerate any of that. And as somebody who had predicted, as you know, I predicted in August of 2016 that Trump was going to win. And I didn't base it on any, you know, specific knowledge or some poll that I had seen or because I'm clairvoyant? No, I said it because I'd been to the Midwest and I talked to all these people that used to vote Democratic who were going to vote for Trump. So in his classic fashion, Trump unloaded on Twitter today and using language that could easily apply to himself. He said, James Comey is a proven leaker and liar. Virtually everyone in Washington thought he should be fired for the terrible job he did until he was in fact fired. He leaked classified information, all caps, for which he should be prosecuted. He lied to Congress under oath, all caps. He is a weak and untruthful slimeball who was, as time has proven, a terrible director of the FBI. His handling of the crooked Hillary Clinton case and the events surrounding it will go down as one of the worst botched jobs of history. It was my great honor to fire James Comey. Now, Trump believes that this is going to help him inoculate his base against the predations presented in the book of uh, Jim Comey. And, again, I see Democrats who (laughs) 
are highly conflicted. They're cheering Comey and Mueller as the useful tools to take down Trump, but they don't appear to have much concern about empowering the deep state long term. And the New York Times already has a review of Comey's book, a full page in Friday's paper. And let me lift two quotes here. The volume offers little in the way of hard news revelations about the investigation by the FBI or special counsel Mueller, not unexpectedly given that such investigations are ongoing, and it lacks the rigorous legal analysis that made Jack Goldsmith's 2007 book The Terror Presidency so incisive about larger dynamics within the Bush administration. Now, here's where they really go into full lips-on-buttocks mode. Refer, they, they go back and forth uh, describing Trump and describing Comey. And in this paragraph about Comey, they say, He is a straight-arrow bureaucrat, an apostle of order and the rule of law, whose reputation as a defender of the Constitution was indelibly shaped by his decision in 2004 to rush to the hospital room of his boss, Attorney General Ashcroft, to prevent Bush White House officials from persuading the ailing Ashcroft to reauthorize an NSA surveillance program that members of the Justice Department believed violated the law. I mean, it's as if they're ready to carve that in marble (laughs) and install the bust or a a full statue. Uh, I mean, this guy is 6'8". It would be a stunning piece of marble. Uh, But come on. That was his one profile in courage. He has been coasting on that ever since. And as you can tell, I will not participate in the canonization of Comey or Mueller. Now, to get people warmed up for the idea that you can learn from your mistakes that a political criminal can be rehabilitated. Trump trotted out the pardon pen and issued a full pardon to Scooter Libby. That would be I, Lewis Libby Jr. He was a top dog assistant to Dick Cheney back in the day. And he was convicted of four felonies in 2007 for perjury in front of a grand jury, lying to FBI investigators, and obstruction of justice. During the investigation to track down who disclosed Valerie Plame Wilson as a CIA agent in retaliation for her husband Joe Wilson's critical comments about the lack of WMD in uh, Iraq and his uh, mission to the nation of Niger, where he confirmed that Niger had not sent yellow cake uranium to Iraq, as had been falsely reported. So this is seen as a signal by Trump that he would protect those who refused to turn on their bosses. And Libby was loyal to Cheney. He, he never did uh, flinch. And it's pretty clear that it wasn't Libby who first leaked Valerie Plame Wilson's identity as a CIA officer. It was Richard Armitage, the number two guy at the State Department at the time. Armitage was never accused, never tried, never convicted. Libby took the fall as a loyal foot soldier. And, of course, it was a big break between Cheney and Bush when Cheney, at the end of the second term, was insisting that Bush give Scooter a full pardon, and W refused. Oh, that was also the case where Judy Miller spent 85 days in jail behind her faux claim of not revealing a source. She expected that was going to get her into the Journalism Hall of Fame, and uh, (laughs) didn't work, Judy. Didn't work. Meanwhile, Michael Cohen is desperately trying to get a federal judge in Manhattan to block the Justice Department from reviewing the documents that were seized under warrants this past Monday. Trump and Cohen are still trying to figure out exactly what was seized in the raids and just how, how much they have to scramble to protect themselves from any, uh, you know, potential criminal charges. And, of course, Cohen and Trump believe that everything they did was protected by the attorney-client privilege. But uh, as Trump may be discovering, the attorney-client privilege is void in the case where it's used to try to cover for criminal activity. Every day I pause for a second to thank the people who support my work here at the Peter B. Collins podcast with your subscriptions. I hit the P.O. box yesterday 
And Sharon Warden from uh, Northern California just renewed her annual subscription. Sharon, thank you very much. And Robert Blumen of San Francisco, who's been a great resource recently, sending me a lot of uh, interesting articles about conservative anti-war people, and I've got one coming up. Uh, He just renewed his annual subscription and paid double, which uh, provides a scholarship for someone who is unable to pay for one yourself. So if you'd like to apply, uh, just email peter at peterbcollins.com. And if you've got cash in the bank and you'd like to support me with a new subscription, I'd be delighted. My birthday is coming up, and uh, I'm asking for 20 new subscribers in honor of my 65th birthday. So get on the stick, will you? Visit peterbcollins.com. There's a menu button. You click on it, pull it down, click on Become a Subscriber. It takes you to the sign-up page, and you can be good to go in a couple of minutes with a level of support that fits your budget. And if you prefer to send me communications by snail mail, I'm happy to receive it. My box is P.O. Box 15660, San Rafael, California, 94915. I will repeat that. Box 15660, San Rafael, zip code 94915. So the war of rhetoric continues to be waged over the alleged chemical release in Duma, Syria, last Saturday. Russia denies it. Syria denies it. Russia claims that the British intelligence service is responsible for staging a fake chemical weapons attack in Duma last weekend. And Britain denies that, denounces it as a blatant lie. Now, there's no external proof. We rely on the White Helmets and the group called SAMS, which we'll touch on in a moment, for the video and the eyewitness accounts of what happened. And both of these groups, the White Helmets and SAMS, have agendas of their own. And they are directly linked to U.S. and British intelligence, particularly the White Helmets. And so... (laughs) I know that many people just fall in line, and when Russia is accused of something, we just say, oh, of course, it's Russia. They're bad guys. And Russia may have some responsibility here. I kind of doubt it. Syria may have responsibility here. I'm open if evidence is presented. But as I mentioned yesterday, none of this would justify expanded U.S. involvement in the war in Syria. And None of it would have the desired effect of protecting innocent women and children from the use of chemical weapons or other deadly munitions. Now, France continues to say that they have proof that Syria is responsible, but Emmanuel Macron is saying that he is calling for dialogue with Russia to be maintained, and he stepped up to bring peace and stability back to Syria. So there is a stall here. Trump was furiously tweeting on Monday that he was ready to launch missiles. And yesterday, it appears that the Secretary of Defense, Mad Dog, persuaded uh, Trump and even John Bolton, new head of the National Security Council, that A, we don't have precise evidence of responsibility, and B, this could escalate wildly out of control. And the Veterans Intelligence Professionals for Sanity have penned a new open letter to the president, delivered via Consortium News yesterday. And they say, we are strongly recommending that you obtain and review actual evidence from the site of the alleged chemical attack in Duma before ordering any military action. We have long brought to light significant evidence questioning the provenance of chemical weapons, indicating that rebel forces may have tried to produce and use such toxic agents in Syria. And one, therefore, must consider the possibility that the supposed gas attack in Duma may have been a carefully constructed propaganda fraud. Such a fraud would have as its purpose the elicitation of precisely the kind of political pressure that now has you contemplating military action. In other words, Mr. President, this may be a bid to mousetrap you into a war that neither you nor your fellow Americans want nor need. Thank you, VIPS. And I mentioned Robert Blumen. He uh, trolls or, or travels through. He reviews a lot of conservative websites. And he found this item at Breitbart yesterday. 
Actually, it was picked up by Russia Insider from Breitbart Radio. And guess who? The killer from Wasilla, Sarah Palin, is opposed to new military action in Syria. Quote, it really makes me nervous that there seems to be some enthusiasm for the U.S. to interject ourselves again in a foreign country's battles when no one has articulated yet what our interest is there. We should have learned our lesson with Iraq and Afghanistan. We just can't allow ourselves get back in that mode with Syria. Another quote, I hate to say it, but a lot of the talk that's enthusiastic about war, unfortunately, comes from people with strong ties to defense contractors and have strong ties to those who ultimately can make money on the operations. So often you got to follow the money, and that leads you to what the root is of some of these arguments. One more. Quote, so those making this point that we need to insert our power and get in there and get rid of Assad, I'm not comfortable with it, and American citizens should not be comfortable with us until there's very focused, articulated reasons provided to us in Congress, and Congress need to be a part of this too, not just the administration, until we find out what the heck we would be doing there. There has to be avoidance of the short-sighted decision-making. Now, her grammar and syntax suck. But I never, ever expected that Sarah Palin would say things that I agree with. I mean, is she smoking some of that special Wasilla meth? (laughs) I don't know. I want to recommend a great expose under the byline of Max Blumenthal, published at Gray Zone, And I guess Gray Zone has spun off from Alternet. I know there have been some changes there. I haven't been uh, apprised of all the details. But Blumenthal does a great job of exposing the Syrian-American medical society, SAMS. And it was SAMS and the White Helmets who provided the video and the eyewitness accounts. SAMS and the White Helmets were also on the scene a year ago in Khan Shakun, where most of the world swallowed what they offered but many of us remain skeptical. And so I encourage you to read Blumenthal's piece. It is highly researched with hyperlinks to all of the things that he writes about SAMs, but they are funded, let's see, like 80% of their money. Their, their funding was $6 million in 2015, and $5.8 million of it came from USAID. And everybody knows that USAID is a front for the CIA. It's how we put money into what we call the promotion of democracy around the world. It was USAID that helped fund the coup in Ukraine. And so when you look at the advocacy that SAMS and its current leadership have taken, they're clearly pro-regime change. And they see that as the rebels are being vanquished, the proxy forces inserted by the United States and its allies into Syria are losing to the Assad uh, military with the help of Russia. There's a plausible scenario here that they got desperate and said, well, let's stage a chemical event. That's the only way to get the attention of the United States. So take a look. It might open your eyes. Well, yesterday I was talking about uh, my sense that the confirmation of Mike Pompeo, who is being shifted from CIA director to secretary of state, was going to meet some resistance from Democrats. Well, I'm sorry, I can't say that it is so. Uh, And despite Rachel Maddow's coverage last night, she said that Democrats were tough on Mike Pompeo and they might block his confirmation. Well, Cory Booker beat him up a little bit on his prior comments on Muslims. Tim Kaine, the vice presidential candidate from the last tour, senator from Virginia, he had some critical comments. But Democrat Ben Cardin of Maryland was just kissing Pompeo's ass. And the Democrats do not have any real venom that they're displaying. They're not trying to kill this confirmation. They're trying to put out some markers to say, well, you know, at the confirmation, I warned him about this. And they're trying to get him to say that he won't just be a toady to Trump, but he is. And he was very deft, quite charming. And I spent about an hour last night on C-SPAN watching the questioning of Mike Pompeo, mostly by Democrats. And I came away feeling 
they're not committed to stopping this nomination. Now, I will give the, the Democrats some credit because they stalled and tried to defeat the confirmation of a former revolving door guy who worked at the EPA. He was the top staffer to James Imhoff of, uh, where is he from, Oklahoma, wherever he's from. Uh, and uh, he went through the revolving door to become a lobbyist for Murray Energy. That's the West Virginia-based company where Mr. Murray went to prison. Now he's running for the Senate, challenging Joe Manchin. Gosh, who will West Virginia choose? At any rate, it's unfortunate, but Andrew Wheeler has been confirmed to the number two job at the EPA. So if Scott Pruitt gets bounced, we're going to have a guy with coal flowing through his veins move up to run the EPA, at least on an interim basis. And the Democrats did put up a fight. The final vote was 53 to 45. That means most of the Democrats hung together to oppose Wheeler's confirmation. The weekly protests in Gaza, based on initial reports, have produced more violence. They're referred to as clashes in the New York Times, but it's pretty one-sided. The killing is done by Israel. Uh, One protester so far has been identified as uh, being killed by sniper fire today. And Haaretz, the Israeli liberal paper, reports 233 wounded. The New York Times uses the uh, same number for fatalities, one, but refers to more than 500 protesters injured, including dozens hit by gunshots, more than 100 hospitalized. So uh, this, again, is highly disproportionate. Yes, there are reports that some Palestinians, uh, one tried to fly a Molotov cocktail over the Israeli border fence using a kite. Now, that shows just how desperate the Palestinians are. There were other Molotov cocktails hurled at the fence, but there were no breaches. And there is no justification for the kind of violence that Israel is visiting on these mostly unarmed and nonviolent protesters. And yesterday I pointed out that only five Democrats have even mildly criticized this killing by Israel. California Governor Moonbeam Brown decided that he couldn't defy Trump's request for National Guard troops to be dispatched to the Mexican border. But he put sharp restrictions on their assignment. They're mostly going to be working on uh, tuning up the Border Patrol's vehicles. In his letter to the Secretary of Homeland Security, Brown said, Let's be crystal clear on the scope of this mission. This will not be a mission to build a new wall. It will not be a mission to round up women and children or detain people escaping violence and seeking a better life. And the California National Guard will not be enforcing federal immigration laws. It's a photo op. That's all it is. And I wish Brown had resisted more. He should have sent 10 National Guard troops down there just to point out that there is no crisis, there is no emergency. A federal judge in Los Angeles who will get a nasty racist tweet from Trump if he <laughs> stays in the, in the news much longer. His name is Judge Manuel Real. And he issued a decisive ruling against the Justice Department and its threats to cut off police funding to jurisdictions that have sanctuary laws related to immigration. It appears to be a total victory for California and for other sanctuary embracing jurisdictions. A very troubling report from Alice Sperry at The Intercept on April 11th. I've linked to it in the show file for this podcast. It deep details only a small percentage of the complaints received by Immigration and Customs Enforcement about the obscene, often unregulated behavior going on in prisons, some of which are privately corporate-operated, where immigration defendants are held. There are allegations of men being required to perform oral sex, women being required to submit to sex, sex between inmates, including rape, that is not stopped by the guards. And the range of these assaults and violations is just really stunning. And 
Out of 1,200 complaints that were filed during a certain period, January of 2010 to September of 2017, there were only 43 investigations. And most of the time, the ICE investigators immediately exonerate the prison guards by claiming that the, like in 59% of the cases, the claims were unsubstantiated. In another 26%, the cases were found unfounded. So only 12% of the cases are actually pursued. And this is an obscene disgrace that will not be addressed by members of either party. In Britain, they have supplied some more what they consider to be compelling evidence of Russian responsibility for the alleged chemical agent visited upon Sergei Skripal and his daughter, Yulia. And I feel like they went to the Minister of Silly Walks, and he said, well, go down the hall to the Minister of Silly Talks. Because what they're telling us is that Russia has in its playbook the idea that you put a nerve agent on a doorknob. And based on that, and a couple of other ridiculous bits of so-called evidence. One of the top spooks in Britain wrote, We therefore continue to judge that only Russia has the technical means, operational experience, and motive for the attack on the Scripples, and that it is highly likely that the Russian state was responsible. There is no plausible alternative explanation. Well, that simply is not true. There are other plausible explanations that you choose, Britain, not to entertain. And despite the denials of Russia, despite the weird statements, one in the phone call by Yulia and then in the one attributed to her that was released by Scotland Yard, well, we continue to see what is an unproven public case. And the media is just all on board with it. And finally today, you've been hearing that Trump has been skewering Jeff Bezos and Amazon, claiming that they rip off the post office. Now, in my initial comments on this, I was wrong. Most of my Amazon shipments are, distri- are uh, delivered by kind of a, an unlabeled van and a kid who's not in a uniform who's probably getting 12 bucks an hour if he's lucky. But it turns out about 40% of Amazon deliveries use the Postal Service, many in rural, uh, you know, final destination locations. Based on what I've seen, the post office is making money and benefiting from this infusion of business from Amazon. But Trump is bitter that Amazon is owned by Jeff Bezos, and he also owns the Washington Post, so he's trying to punish the Post by punishing Amazon. He has launched a new task force to study the finances of the U.S. Postal Service. And let's bet that they come up with stuff that claims that Amazon needs to pay more, but they will not touch the very reason why the Postal Service shows a deficit every year. It's because Congress has saddled this agency alone among every government agency, requiring it to prepay the medical and retirement benefits of every employee. It's totally ridiculous. And it's what produces this impression that the Postal Service is losing money and that we've got a privatized delivery of the mail. Will that charade be exposed by the Trump task force? (laughs) Nah. Well, have a great weekend. Thanks for listening to my daily news and comment podcast. Share it with a friend. And you can find it on YouTube. Click the subscribe button when you're there. Happy trails to you until we meet again. Happy trails to you. Keep smiling up.